My name is Nathan DeLong. I'm a sales engineer here at SalesPad, and uh, today we're going to be doing video two of actually a three-part series on our data collection product. And this one is going to be using data collection to manage your inventory. So in this three-part series, we've already gone over receiving, and our next video is going to be for order fulfillment. And right now in this video, we're gonna focus on the middle part. Well, we have product in our warehouse, how does data collection help us manage and work with that product while we've got it here on site? We're just taking care of it. Maybe we're moving it from place to place. We'll go through doing some stock counting type activities as well. Um, but really in general, when we are having inventory that's in our warehouse, we do have some considerations. One of those is what do we do if we have multiple warehouses? So maybe multiple physical locations that we have that all need to be taken care of. The other one would be to think about our warehouse layout. One thing that I've always thought and I still think is if you have one of those facilities that was built maybe 50, 60 years ago and the aisles are barely wide enough for your forklift to turn around in, and then you compare that to a brand new facility it has all the bells and whistles, it has absolutely every advantage that you could ever want to me personally, if that 50 year old facility is managed efficiently and if it has an effective user friendly layout, it is going to be more efficient than even the brand new facility. Um, and with data collection uh, specifically or particularly with data collection and the extended warehouse module, I really believe that you get a large tool set that helps you make sure that you're using whatever space you have, whether it's brand new, whether it's 100 years old, you're using that space as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Of course, another consideration when it comes to managing our inventory is what do stock counts look like? Who can perform them? How often do we perform them? Are we doing um, just a count of items that are in a particular bin location? Or are we doing um, a count that is all of a particular item regardless of where it is in our warehouse? And how do we manage through those? How do we maybe make stock counting a little bit easier to do as well? So maybe we've got some folks out in the warehouse that have some extra time. Maybe we tell them use some of that time to just go count an item and help us make sure that we're keeping our inventory as accurate as possible. We're catching shrinkage if it's occurring. Um, that we're making sure that we have that accurate representation in our ERP system of what's actually in our physical facility. Of course, looking at um, lot and serial tracking is also a very important consideration. If we are using lot tracked or serial tracked items, we wanna make sure that we can do that easily. Um, one place where data collection is gonna come into play there, of course, is with the barcoding capabilities. If we can scan a lot number or scan a serial number, we're really doing a lot there to eliminate any kind of data entry errors and we're also speeding that process up as well. As far as having an effective warehouse management process, I think it's really important, again, have an effective layout. You know, if you're going to start at square one, that really does come down to how is your warehouse laid out and how have you laid it out to help optimize working with your inventory. Mm -hmm. I personally am a big believer in using inventory bins. Now, some folks might think that um, a bin, for whatever reason, is some set size. It's like a, maybe like a drawer or something like that. Of course it's not. A bin is really just a way for us to refer quickly to a physical location within our warehouse. And I think that bins are extremely helpful for, for pinpointing precisely where an item exists in our inventory. That being said, if you're using data collection, you do not need to use bins. There's nothing in it that's forcing you to. I just happen to come from a background where bins are absolutely everywhere and I've grown to really love them. I think that, again, establishing your stock count process. So how often do we do it? Who's responsible for it? It's not a bad idea. Um, streamlining the process maybe for inventory adjustments and site-to-site -site transfers. So how are we managing that? Um, what tools do we have to maybe make that a little bit quicker or a little bit easier? I think should really be a consideration of having a good warehouse management process. 
And then finally, I think having a good procedure in place for bin replenishment. So again, if we have a situation where maybe our bins that are easy to interact with are limited in how much product they can hold, of course they are, right? Like if we have racks, we know that unless we have a forklift, maybe level five of our rack is not necessarily going to be super easy to get to, but can we use some kind of a forward replenishment or a forward pick to make sure that we are keeping some product always available in those easy to access locations. A couple notes about data collection, and if you watched the first video, you'll have already heard these. If you're just watching this video in particular, you'll be hearing these maybe for the first time. But the first thing to keep in mind is that data collection is directly integrated into GP exactly the same way that SalesPad is. There is no syncing required between the two. Anything that we do on our mobile device in data collection or anything that we do in the data collection console um, or for that matter anything we do in sales pad will immediately be reflected in GP. There's no need to do any kind of manual thinking or really even think about it. We're all sharing the same data so we don't have to do anything special to make sure that it's updated all across the board. It will automatically be updated across the board. Another thing to keep in mind in data collection, uh, you can create bin locations. However, if you want to create new site locations, new warehouses, you do have to do that activity still in GP. So that, to me, is fairly sensible because if you think about the typical warehouse manager, they aren't probably going to be creating physical warehouses every day, but they may want to have the ability, or you might want to give them the ability through their security settings, to use the data collection console to establish new bins in their warehouse that they're responsible for. Of course, we can also, and we will be using data collection, uh, extended warehouse uh, to show how we can exclude some locations from being pickable. So in other words, we might have some quarantine locations that we aren't going to allow someone with their mobile device to pull product from. We're also gonna show a little bit about how we set zones for aisles and locations and all that good stuff too, to help optimize that uh, product flow a little bit in our warehouse. And then of course, we're going to be going through stock counts. We're gonna be going through site transfers and bin transfers. So if we jump right in, here on my uh, computer in my demo environment, I do have data collection extended warehouse installed. So we're going to go ahead and start with our data collection server tab. Now, again, if you watched the first video, this is familiar territory. If you're just watching this video, this is going to be something to bear in mind. But the data collection console is also where we control the data collection server. The data collection server is what allows our mobile devices. In my case, it's an iPod Touch that has a Honeywell sled on it for scanning barcodes. The data collection server is what's going to allow those mobile devices to talk to our database. Now, if you have, say, up to five or maybe six mobile devices in your warehouse, the data collection server as a Windows service, which is, which is what it is here on my demo environment, because of course I only have one mobile device, is perfectly fine though. Now if you're getting more than say five or six devices in your environment, to ensure that those devices have the best performance, it's a really good idea to, as you're implementing data collection server with our team, we can go ahead and set that up as an IIS service that is going to allow it to be um, more optimized for folks who are out there in the warehouse. They will experience much better performance that way. Um, and it's a process that will help you through. Um, as part of implementation, we will help you decide whether the Windows service or whether the IIS service is appropriate, and we'll make sure that those get set up for you as well. So, when we have a product that's in our stock, one thing I think that always comes up is the need to print out item labels. Whether it's because maybe as we're moving items around in our warehouse, maybe we're moving a skid of items to get at something behind there, or maybe we do have really tight, narrow aisles and we just tend to kind of bump up against some cartons that might be stored on our racks. We do run into a need to print item labels in data collection in the console here. It's very simple to do that. I'm just going to go here to print item labels and let's go ahead and grab a particular item number, just like that. 
And from here, we can go ahead and grab any one of these purchase orders. It really doesn't matter. Go to print, and then we can preview that. Now, this is the sample item label that is sort of built into data collection. It's completely configurable. You can also have multiple item label formats if that's something that's necessary in your environment. But by default, this is what it looks like. And then from here, of course, I could send that maybe to a zebra printer if I want to make maybe some self-adhesive labels. Of course, you could also print it on a regular printer. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. But it's just a need that is going to come up from time to time. And by the same token, there is going to be a need probably from time to time to go ahead and print bin labels. Now, again, for the same reasons, right? We might have times where we, we accidentally injure one of our bin labels and we need to replace it. The other place where this can come in handy too, though, is if we move bins around. Now, I really like the idea of putting your bin labels, if you can, on a sort of magnetic backing so that they're easy to move. So maybe one day we get a really large product in that we need to put into, say, bin 02A01, right? Well, maybe we can move the following bin labels down the rack really easily if they're magnetic. It's just an idea. Or if we're going ahead and maybe just revamping how we have our warehouse set up, we can go ahead and print those warehouse, those uh, bin labels for our warehouse here. So I'm just going to go ahead and put in Warehouse, that's my site, and I'm going to clear out my auto filter row, and this is the exact same kind of auto filter row with a grid that we have in SalesPad Desktop, and again, it can be a really efficient way to go ahead and print or find particular bins. So let's go ahead here. I'm going to actually grab all of my bins, just like that. If we hit print and then preview that, we will get really nice labels for all of the bins in our warehouse. And then, of course, if I need to just print out a particular bin, one great way to do it is with that auto filter row. So just like this, I'm going to go to 02A01, select it, hit print. And just like that, I have a, a copy of that bin label. And again, if it gets damaged just in the day-to-day -day course of doing business, which can happen. Now, with Data Collection Extended Warehouse, we also do have some more granular warehouse configuration options. You'll see in this window here, I have all of my warehouses listed down the left side of the screen. For any location that I choose, you'll notice that I can see the particular bins that I have set up for that location. In the case of my uh, work center locations, I, in my demo environment, I happen to have some work centers, like so a manufacturing type environment, and I do track inventory that's in those work centers. But you'll notice for these work centers, I don't have any bins created. As soon as I go to my warehouse, that's where I have the vast majority of my bins set up because that's where I'm going to be storing product. I need to find it. Whereas if I just go to, say, work center one out on the floor, that's a limited area. It should be easy to find something that's out there. In addition to being able to see all of our bins, I can also see here if I can pick from that bin, if I can move from that bin, or move into that bin as well, whether I can allocate inventory that's sitting in that bin on an order, and then whether I can receive to it. These controls can be really helpful if you have things like here, I have a quarantine location that I've created. And you'll notice for my quarantine loca location, I can't pick any product from there. So if somebody out in the warehouse has their mobile device and they attempt to do a pick operation on that quarantine bin, data collection is not going to allow them to carry that out. And again, it's because we've basically said here in our setup, that is not a location that you can pick from. However, I do have it set up so I can receive to that location, along with I have a receiving location, I have a raw materials location. All of those locations are places where I can receive product to. But because in my demo environment, I have a, a sort of business process, right, for 
receiving product in this case. And in my case, once we receive it, we either put it in receiving or we quarantine it. Or we might take product from, say, our manufacturing floor or from elsewhere in our warehouse and we might quarantine it. So I can receive to those locations, but what I don't want to have happen necessarily, maybe um, someone who's working out on the dock, to receive product straight into a bin location without doing a receiving inspection. So I'm able to control that in here just by setting these checkboxes. And if we choose one of these locations, you can see where we set those. So for my receiving bin that I've selected right here in the center of the screen, I can go ahead and I can mark it as unavailable if I'd like. I can set it as whether or not it's pickable, whether or not I can receive to it. I can also give it dimensions. I can give it a zone in an aisle if that's something that's important to me. There's another setting in here that's important to think of. Um, I know we sort of touched on very quickly this idea of having locations that are easy to access versus locations that are a little bit more difficult to access. And so I do have in my demo environment a forward pick location. And you'll notice that's like 03A01. So in my world, that means that that's going to be aisle three, column A, level one. So right on the ground, I have these um, GPS devices where I like to have a bunch of those down there where they're easy to pick. Say it's a fast moving item, so I want my pickers to be able to grab them easily. But that, that product is actually coming from a replenishment location, which is, in my case, aisle three, column A, level two, which is harder to get at because it's physically more difficult to get in there. So in this replenishment location, you'll notice that I have an allocation lock and I am allowing product to be received into it. So that's to enable that forward pick. In other words, my replenishment location, I can't allocate orders out of there and I also have to be able to receive product into it. So that's some of the warehouse setup that is a little bit a little bit more fine-grained that does exist in data collection if you have extended warehouse setup. Um, again, this whole business of using these different, whether it's pickable, whether it's allocatable, whether you can receive to it, and then the whole thing with can we go ahead and enable forward pick locations and then have data collection on the mobile device suggest transfers from that secondary location into our forward pick bin when it falls below a certain level of a certain item. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up now my mobile device. Um, and let's go take a look at some of the different functions that exist on the mobile device for dealing with inventory while we just have it in stock. So for example, one thing that's probably gonna come up quite a lot um, in a day-to-day -day basis is doing inventory lookups. So if I grab that option, you notice I can go ahead and now look up a particular item number that I'm probably standing in front of. Now, there's a few different ways to get the information into these fields on the mobile device. Anytime that we see this rectangle around a field, it's telling us that if we have a device that has a scanner, we can then scan a barcode into that field. So for my item number, I'm gonna go ahead and scan, and let's look up a uh, backpack. I'll pretend that's what I'm standing in front of here. So it's gonna go ahead, it's gonna pull that item, and then it's gonna tell me some information about that item. So for example, if I go look at the bin, it's gonna tell me that currently in my warehouse location, I only have 48 of these just in one bin, 02A01. It's gonna tell me whether or not this item is lot or serial tracked. In this case, it is not a tracked item. It's going to go ahead and break down my quantity on hand, what I have allocated there, what I have available, what I have on PO, and what I've received as well. And last, it is gonna let me look at any related documents where this item is appearing. So currently, we've got this item on some orders, and then we've got it on some purchase orders as well. 
So it's just giving us a quick way that if we happen to be walking the warehouse, we land in front of an item, and we want to go ahead and scan that item really quickly. So another thing that we can, of course, do here in data collection on our mobile device is bin transfers. So if we hop into bin transfers, we have this option up here for using replenishments. Now, that is driven by what we have set up back here in data collection in the console for forward pick and replenishment locations. So you'll notice that right here we've got in our forward pick location a capacity of 450 pieces and a refill threshold of 250 pieces. So in other words, when I get below 250 GPS 01 in my forward pick location, if someone on their mobile device slides over to say use replenishments, data collection is going to then have available to them the ability to use a suggested transfer from that replenishment location to the forward pick location. So I've turned on use replenishments. Now if I just tap here next to item number, it's going to show me this GPS 01 and it's going to suggest that I go ahead and move 199 pieces because unfortunately I don't have all say uh, 250 pieces in my stock right now. I'm a little bit low on this GPS 01 item but it's going to suggest that I move as many as possible from my replenishment location to my forward pick location. So we can use those suggested transfers for things like if we have product that moves quickly, that we want to keep in a location that's easy to access and easy to pick from, that is the whole point of having this forward pick. But the other way that we can then leverage that is by telling the folks that are in the warehouse, if you happen to have some extra time, go to your bin transfer, check out use replenishments, and go through and complete those suggested replenishments so that we're ready for when we need to then pick those items again. Now we can also go ahead and just do a really standard bin transfer. In this case, I'm not going to use replenishments. I'm just going to pretend that I have an item that I'd like to transfer from one location to another. And in this case, let's go ahead and grab our backpacks again. I love to pick on that item. So I'm gonna grab those. And then it's going to ask me, what bin do I want to come from? And then what bin do I want to go to? And in this case, if I'm sitting right, or standing rather, hopefully, right in front of my backpacks location, let's go ahead and scan that. And then what bin do I want to send them to? I'll go down the row a little bit and get there and then scan that location. It's going to ask me, what quantity do I want to move? And in this case, I, my quantity is something that I'm incrementing by scan. So every time I scan that backpack item, it's going to add another one for me to transfer. In this case, I'm just going to stick with moving one. And if I want, I can add any notes that I need to to refer back to this transfer or something I want to say about why I transferred this product if I need to. I can also establish reason codes. So maybe if we're transferring something from a stocked bin to our quarantine location, maybe I have a reason code there set up that says something like internal damage. So in other words, if while we have the inventory in our stock, if I go ahead and maybe back over it with the forklift or I drop it, maybe I have a reason code set up to track that and I call that maybe internal damage. Um, every time I'm moving something then from my stocked bins into my quarantine location, I can say that. Or maybe I can say manufacturing defect if I'm moving it to quarantine, something like that. In this case, we'll go ahead, let's submit our transfer. It's gonna tell me that it's a successful bin transfer right on the screen. And then I can go on and move other things if I'd like to. But really that increment by scanning, that's really our third way of entering quantities when we're working with product and data collection. We can type in the number, 
We can go ahead and use our plus minus buttons to increment one at a time. And then if we want, we can ask that whoever is using data collection on their mobile device, that they have to individually scan each item just as a confirmation step. The next thing we can look at is going to be a site transfer. So I'm gonna go ahead and hop in here. And then let's go ahead and grab an item number really quickly. There we go. So it's going to be telling me now that it's not tracked, which is fine. This isn't a lot or a serial tracked item. It's going to say from where. By default, when I log in, and you set this for each user, but each user really belongs to a default location. My default location in my demo environment is the warehouse site. So my from site is always going to be warehouse. As far as from bin, let's go in here. And I'm going to go ahead and pick on that 02A02 that I just moved over. So let's grab it. And of course our quantity will be one here. In here, I don't have that rule set up where I have to scan each individual item. So if I want, I can tap in here, I can type in a number, or I can increment using my plus and minus buttons on the screen right here. Uh, it's going to ask what site I want to move this to. And in this case, I would like to go ahead and move it to my south location. It's going to ask me what bin I want to put it in there. And of course here, I can either scan if I happen to have a barcode for that location's bins right in front of me, or I can go ahead and use the little triangle right next to bin and select one. And I'm going to go ahead and grab this E10S2. And then once again, we can go ahead and use notes to say something particular about this. So maybe like attention Bob, if Bob is maybe my warehouse manager at my south location. We can also use a reason code. And maybe in this case, you might configure a reason code for site transfers that's something like out of stock. You know, So I'm moving this because my south location ran out of stock and I wanna be able to record that reason code so that in the future, I can go ahead and report on that and maybe get, an, get some metrics around how much of a problem that might be. Same thing with internal damage for that matter. Um, that might be something that we do wanna be tracking with reason codes because later on, we can report on that and see how often is that happening and try to work out, is it maybe something we're doing? Maybe it's always happening with a particular item number and we're kind of starting to figure out the packaging for that item isn't really as robust as it should be something like that. So let's go ahead and submit our site transfer. And it's going to go ahead and give us a transfer number, which is perfect. Now, at this point, all that we are really going to see in that site transfer is if we go here in data collection to our inventory lookup, and then if we go look for that backpack 01 item, in this case, really all that we are going to see to indicate that we have that site transfer coming is on our uh, allocations tab down here. We choose our warehouse location. There is that site transfer. You'll notice that batch is called sales pad DC. There's one that's leaving from today. Of course, it's not for a customer or anything because we're doing site transfer, we're still the customer. We don't have like really a customer for site transfers. It's not like a sale. This is the only place that we're going to see this site transfer until it's posted in GP. Whether that's by a GP user going in and posting it or whether we're using a third party posting tool. The reason for that is because when we're doing site transfers, we're taking value out of the inventory for our from location and we're putting value in to the inventory in the receiving location and therefore it has to be posted in GP because it's hitting our cost, our inventory valuation. Um, when we're doing bin transfers within a site, we can do those all day. There's no posting that's required because we're not changing anything that's in our financials. But anytime we have these transactions that are hitting our financials, they do have to be posted in GP. And then I suppose the last thing that we should really look at when it comes to talking about dealing with inventory while we have it on site is stock counts. One unique feature of data collection is we can initiate, carry out, and close stock counts 
right from our mobile device. If we go in here, we can go and grab our stock counts option. And then here for our count ID, I'm gonna tap this little I, and I'm gonna go ahead and create a new count. At this point, it's going to allow me to choose a bin that I would like to count. So I'm going to go ahead and just scan one. Of course, we could always type one in as well. And then it's gonna ask me what item number. Well, I'm gonna pick on my backpacks again. There we go. And for count ID, I'm gonna leave that blank at this point. So let's go submit that. It's going to tell me right on the screen what my stock count ID is. It's going to ask me if I'd like to return to the stock count screen. Of course, I'll say yes. So now I can go ahead and grab that count. Data collection is going to tell me on my mobile device that this count has not been started yet. So I'm going to click my little I again. Start count. Now, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and be carrying out that stock count. So for my item number, I can either scan it or I can use the little triangle next to it and select it like that. It's going to automatically pull in the bin that we set up when we created this stock count. And then it's going to ask me, how many of that item am I counting in that particular location. So in this case, let's go ahead and grab that item. And there's a few things that can happen at this point. Now, if I go ahead and say, put in a different number from what's in my bin, it's gonna tell me that a variance has been generated that has to be posted in GP. So let's take a look and see what that would look like. I was just looking on my environment here and seeing it looks like we're expecting to have 87 in this bin. But if I go ahead and type in 86 instead, and again here we can put notes in a reason code if we have any that are set up. I don't personally have any reason codes configured at this point for stock counts, but we can certainly create them. So again, let's get our 86 in there. And let's go submit that. It's going to tell me that that's been submitted. And now I'm going to go ahead and um, click my little I again next to my stock count. And I'm going to choose finish count. And let's go ahead and do that. And at this point, since I was expecting to have 87 in that bin, but I only found 86 of them, it's going to tell me that uh, a stock count, a variance has been created. Now, that is going to need to be posted in GP. Again, for the same reason that we have to post those site transfers, because since I found less, or even if I found more, of the item that my stock count was counting, I now have to post that in GP because it's going to affect my inventory value. It's going to hit my books, in other words. So that really takes us through how easy it is to do stock counts from a mobile device using data collection. By making it easier to get these stock counts initiated to carry them out, they sort of start becoming less of a special thing that we do and more of a regular activity, which is a really good thing when it comes to keeping track of our inventory while we have it on hand. They're a great way to catch if we are having a lot of variances entered for particular items, it'll let us dig into that and figure out why that's happening and what part of our processes we might need to tighten up to avoid having those. So again, by bringing stock counts to our mobile devices, we make it easier now with data collection to do those stock counts and hopefully also make it so that we do them more frequently. Again, there's really no danger to it. It has to be posted in GP if there's any variance, whether it's up or down, because again, just like our site transfers, that's something that's hitting our books. So we do need to post it there in GP, and that means too that we have an auditing step that's built into the process. So just by telling uh, folks that, hey, if you have an extra 10 minutes, 
Go to a stock count, count a bin, count a particular item. It's not like by opening that up, we're gonna have a bunch of things immediately posting into GP that might not make any sense. There's really no danger in it. There's no downside to it. And I think that by having stock counts be easier to do, it does encourage people to do them more frequently. And I do think they're a great way to make sure that when we have our inventory on hand, we're just maintaining the inventory, we have it in our warehouse, we're not receiving it, we're not fulfilling it yet, stock counts are a great way to catch any potential problems before they get out of hand. And uh, in our next video, we are gonna be looking at fulfillment, so stay tuned if that's next on your list. Um, otherwise, if this is the only one that you wanted to see, I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you got value out of it. Um, and thank you so much for watching.